Have you ever watched other people in the subway? So strange to ignore someone who's right up in your face. A can of sardines spring to mind except passengers aren't joined by the bond of thick oil or brine. Instead, they're stewing in a marisma of sweat, cologne, and annoyance. Everybody absorbed in their own little world's warm, warm little cocoons. They're whizzing through the bowels of the city at a brisk clip. You'll find people reading books, newspapers, and maybe on a PlayStation Portable. Sometimes on a smartphone. Except me. I'll always be looking through the cl thick glass windows at the flickering blackness just beyond. Sometimes late at night, I hope I'll get on the same train once more so I can see it all again. It had been one of those weeks, actually. It had been one of those months where the targets piled up like so much dirty laundry, the boss on my case, miserable babbling fart with his mortgage and his European sports car, riding us all for another bullshit project for some client across the country. The days and nice nights lost their meaning. And at work early to beat the crowd, heading home without ever seeing the light of the sun. Caffeine was my only friend. The last thing on the agenda for the workday was a mad sprint to the last train home because the miserable bastard wouldn't even sign off the late night taxi claims. It showed up on the work-life balance indicators, he said. It had been another mindless day of numbers, presentation slides, and text. To be frank, I didn't even know if the version of the meaningless report I was working on, the 5th or the 15th. Nor could I have told you the difference between the two. The office had already been emptied out at an hour before. My last co-worker gave me a commemorating pat on the back as they headed off. I cursed as I stuffed my laptop and swept some papers into my bag. I was going to miss the train. The stale warmth of a building gave way to the bitter cold as I hit the streets running. The station was deserted. Not unthinkable at this time of night, but eerie all the same. There's something about a hollow space meant for crowds. I'm not talking about muggers or anything like that. There is an air of the forbidden that... about these empty spaces. That's how the night started out. Expectant. Waiting for something to happen. Not that I cared at the time. The escalators were out for the night. I was wheezing hard by the time I got to the bottom. And that old college fitness long drowned under an ocean of booze buried under a mountain of fast food. I thought the last train had already left, resigning myself to a long wait for an expensive taxi ride back. I was about to leave when a train pulled up with the familiar steam and the scream of metal and metal. Graffiti had borne the gray skin of the train. Tribal tattoos for the modern locomotive. The doors hissed, warm ale belched from the cabin, and I got in. The train strained full. Not packed, but it was crowded. I found my seat in between an old man in a large brown overcoat and a young lady that was wearing a dark formal dress. A large flower pinned to her breast. Her face was a mask of mascara and eyeshadow unexpectedly applied. Across me sat a pair of army fatigues, their scalps shining pink under buzz cuts, and many more besides. It was a puzzling thing to have a cabin so full late at night, and with such a motley crew of inhabitants. With a shudder, the train pulled out from the station. I shed, settled back continued, contentedly into my seat. 
The network connection in the tunnels was never dependable. I had to find another way to entertain myself on the ride home. The noise from the screech of the rails and the rush of the air outside seemed muted. Instead, the cabin was filled with soft sirs. The hushed tones of a crowd in a theater, expected but subdued. The cabin felt colder than it should have been. Was the heating out again? It couldn't be. I was certain that the cabin was warmer than the platform a second ago, yet now it felt like I was back outside in the howling cold. I tugged my jacket a little tighter. I looked at the hodgepodge of strange individuals in the cabin. Everyone seemed out of place. Why would there be a gaggle of high school kids? Obviously inebriated, this late at night. Or a wellfish girl that was wearing what seemed to be a school uniform. I shifted uncomfortably on the sculpted plastic seat. Not a single mobile phone or electronic device in sight. Strange sight in this day and age. I looked up and saw a row of LED lights that indicated the trance process along my route. Four more stops. I was still staring at the display when the train whizzed by the next station. It didn't stop. It didn't even slow down. It just kept... It didn't even slow down. It just kept going right. The lights and pillars of the station streamed by in a blur. I jerked upright in my seat, my eyes widening. What kind of train had I gotten on? The rest of the crowd was unfazed by this development. If anything, the low buzz of whispers got even louder as the train progressed. We were still hurtling through the dark tunnel, the overhead lights flickering on and off. When the little girl in the school uniform affixed me and stared, wide-eyed. She crept over to the group of high schoolers and tugged on the sleeve of one of the young men. He must have been a basketball player towering over his companions. He nearly had to bend double to bring his ear down to the little girl's face. Her jaw worked up and down as she whispered something to him urgently. I heard nothing over the sound of the train. He blinked and took a step back. When he looked back into my direction, as seeing me for the first time, his handsome face twisted strangely. What was it? Anger? No. It looked like he wanted something. He looked... hungry. His compatriots noticed the break in conversation, directed their gaze and the focus to his attention. To me. The same gaunt of emotion cycled through their faces, shock and then sharpening and hardening of their features. They were hungry too. The giant took a step forward, perhaps meaning some harm for her, some slight on his person that I have committed, even though one of the schoolgirls held him back. The feeling spread through the cabin like a spark arcing from person to person. The two uniformed men looking up and tightening their jaws. The old man next to me perked up and scooted down another seat so that he could look at me without straining his neck. Outside, a blur of lights told me that we went by another station. Three more stops. I shrank back in my seat. The tendon straining at the surface of my hands as I clutch at my back protectively. As though that stupid jester grabbing on my work, the focus of my life, would ground me and take me away from this nightmare. It didn't. I felt the weight of their eyes on me. Like insects crawling over my skin. Something was wrong. So clearly wrong. This strange crowd, so different yet each of them wearing the naked need on their faces.
don't mind them. They're just jealous of you. The young lady by my side. Her voice... Her voice was soft and marvelous. Don't stare back and don't talk to them. I turned to look at my companion. What are they jealous of? I just wanted to catch the last train home. It's the last train home for all of us, too, she smiled. She was very pale and very beautiful, but not all of them want to be here. And looking at you going home tonight makes them so very unhappy. Where did they all come from? Was there a convention? A meeting? I cast my eyes around the cabin again, but stopping halfway by her strong fingers on my chin. Her fingers were icy cold. She turned my head around to face her. Everywhere. All around. Most of them didn't want to be here. Sent me, maybe. I had enough of where I was. I missed my parents. I haven't seen them in such a long time. It took a while for me to gather enough courage to go look for them. She paused suddenly, pensive on what she said. You're not meant to be here, you know. You're on the wrong train. This isn't your ride. Outside the window, another station went by. My eyes flickered back to the board with all the little lights. Two stops to home. The whispering in the cabin started to go up again, louder than before, still muffled by the sounds of the rails and the rushing air outside. They were talking about me. The atmosphere grew oppressive. The attention of the crowd felt like a rock on my chest, a vice. A breathing grew. My breathing grew labored. Such caused each inhalation to be a struggle, and I wheezed. My companion sensed my discomfort. I wish I can help, she said sadly. It'll stop when we get to the end of the line, I suppose. Her eyes lit up at the thought. She turned around and scooted up to the seat, her knees on the, on the hard plastic, palms on the cold glass. Even with her face pressed up against the glass, there wasn't a trace of fog on the window by her breath, if she was even breathing at all. Here, why don't you take this? I won't need it where I'm going. She fumbled at her dress, detached the white flower and pressed it in my hands. The sweet smell of the lily took my attention away from the pain in my chest. We're here! She was quivering with excitement as the train began to slow. I looked up at the board overhead. All the lights on the map had gone out. Where were we? She cupped my chin under her hands. It was only then with her arms so close to my face that I saw the network of fine white lines that crisscrossed her farmland. She caught the flick of my eyes toward her arms. She shrugged sheepishly. Practice makes perfect, she said. She frowned suddenly, serious again. This stop is for the rest of us. You can't join us. You have to stay here. She leaned forward quickly and gave me a kiss on my cheek. Her cold lip burned like ice on my cheek. The people in the cabin quickly turned their attention to the approaching platform. I felt the weight on my chest ease. The whispering grew into a cresco as they pointed and chattered excitedly. The platform drew close. And what a sight it was. I didn't recognize the titles or the posters. I must have taken this train at least a thousand times. I could have closed my eyes and named every station in order and the time between stations if I wanted to. And yet I was lost. There was nothing in the platform that helped in any way. No signs, no directions. What the platform had was people, a million, a million sea of heads and faces, all expectant, 
all eagerly waiting. When the door opened, it let out a roar, roar of the crowd outside, shouts and shrieks and yells and tears. So many tears. The passengers burst out of the train, throwing themselves into a wailing sea of people. I saw one of the army boys embracing an older gentleman, who was also dressed in military fatigues. None of that new age stuff, that pixelated camouflage. This was old school, with big green and brown blotches. The resemblance between the two was clear. They parted. The younger man introduced his father to his compatriot. The older man hugged him tightly as if he was hugging his own son. The group of teenagers whoop and leapt out as they pushed through the crowd, seeking some new adventure for the night. I caught the last glimpse of, glimpse of the blonde locks of the basketball player as they vanished around the corner. The old man that was sitting by me had found an elegant looking lady in her thirties. Her sunlit dress looked out of place for a big cold of winter. Or had I mistaken the man for someone else? I looked over and it wasn't an old man anymore, but a young couple laughing in the prime of their lives. No, it was the same coat and his features, lined with a jealous greed scant moments ago. Now lit with, a f with fierce joy. As the train doors hissed shut, I saw the girl that sat next to me on the train. She was in tears with her arms around a well-dressed couple. She waved at me as the train pulled out of the station. I waved back. My legs shook as I got off the train at my stop. The platform was reassuringly deserted. I watched as the train screeched into the distant darkness of the tunnel. I gingerly touched the numb spot on my cheek where the girl had kissed me. My fingers came away wet. I didn't even remember my tears falling. My nose was suddenly assaulted by a rich, thick greenhouse scent, decaying plat matter. I fished out the lily from my coat pocket, where the strange girl had left it. The pristine white pillows were dry to the point of crumbling and speckled black with rot. I let it fall from my fingers and watched it bounce on the station floor. I sat there, like an unmelting snowflake on the pocket gray concrete. I stared at it for a long time before I began the long trek home. <laughs>